right, everybody. This is exciting because we have our absent in the prior episode, <laughs> third co-founder. For those of you who know Hello Audio and been around us a while, you're like, where the heck is Derek? Well, this is a Derek episode. Hopefully he'll come back in other scenarios. But um, as of right now, we wanted Derek to come on and kind of give um, just the product story. Like in the last episode you heard, Nora and I talk a lot about like the birth of Hello Audio and how it came to be. And it was about the partnership and some of the journey. Um, but we want to talk about the journey from the product perspective, right? This is a tech company. The product is the star of the show. Um, and uh, Derek Padilla is the man behind it. Mm -hmm. It's the true. Star of the show, the rock star. <laughs> <laughs> product rock star. Yeah, it's true. Um, I do have a slight cold, so apologies for that. But yes, I can speak to the early, like before it was Hello Audio and mm -hmm. what we wanted to do, what we sought solutions for if it existed somewhere and it really didn't. And so that was the moment of like, we should do it. Um, and yeah, I think one of the first things we tested was like how private is private, which is a pretty mm. dang important question when you're like, I'm founding a company that's promise is to produce private content. So what does it mean to be a private podcast um, privacy wise? How locked down is that stuff? So uh, we just threw our own course in a private podcast and we're like, let's see if it leaks. That was the first test. Um, <laughs> where does it show up if you put a private podcast and release it? I don't know how many people we had in that course, but it was a few hundred. And so if they all had access to it, where does it go? And does it just end up like the questions we still get from users now is like, if I put this out there, is it um, findable by other people? If my student subscribes to my course podcast in Apple podcast, does that mean it's on Apple? Um, and the answer is no. So that's good. Um, and there's some scary moments where it seems like that's not true. Podcast at, so first of all, the apps themselves are a big part of the story of our product yeah. because of um, how podcasting works. But yeah, there's weird stuff that happens. Like you subscribe in pod Podcast Addict on Android phones and you have to check a box that says, is this a private podcast? And if you forget to check that, does that mean it's now publicly available? Seems like it's true, but it's not. It doesn't end up publicly out there. I don't know why that box exists, yeah, um, but we've tested like making sure that's true. So there's Derek just... knows way too much about podcast yeah. apps and other podcasts. Just, <clears throat> just like way too much detail. <laughs> a lot of detail and specifically about the private part was, like I said, the first question. And even like, I'm sure you guys talked about podcast, your course, that iteration of yeah. it before it was Hello Audio. Um, before that was even a thing, it was just a podcast feed of um build a better beta. And that was it. Yeah. And that was the test case of does this work? Um, how does it work? And like I said, what's possible with it not being private. So um, it lived in a podcast feed for a few hundred students for months and nothing bad happened that I, I like kept searching like Apple's, but it wasn't on Spotify then, but other podcast directories just being like, is this out there somewhere? Can you find it? Um, feeling the like, wait, Podcast Attic could let you add a private feed without checking private. Is it now public? And it's not. Um, yeah. So this going through that and just living, letting it live for months, like out there, um, was a good first test. And then some like early users, um, the MVP was ridiculously MVP. Give me your files in a Google drive folder and I'll yeah, put them like in an S3 MVP. bucket. Yeah. Yeah. Manual, all manual. manual. I literally manually wrote RSS feeds. Like I had a mm -hmm. template and like copy pasted links to S3 files. Uh, nuts. The most jank you could imagine. And it worked. But what's interesting, <laughs> it, totally it worked. worked. And it allowed us to sell that first initial batch mm -hmm. and be like, um, so I, we didn't feel terrible by saying, trust us, we're going to build it, but we can also give you something in the meantime. Mm -hmm. Like, no, you can't easily do it yourself. We will, but we will manually do it. Um, and yeah, we promise it's not out there. We've tested that. And so that was a cool kind of, um, I don't know, scrappy way to yeah. get an, um, to get some cash, to be able to start hiring developers and start looking for what the next move was and offering at least something to folks who invested us that early. Yeah. And I think 
we were doing something right that we didn't really know we were doing right. We were getting users in the app without it being an app yet. We were getting users experiencing giving a feed to their students ah, before the like app mm -hmm. really existed. And there wasn't like an email that was sent to them. It was like, okay, here's your link. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think there were two versions of it before it was actually released as an app where the first version was like, there's one link and everyone shares it, which is what most podcast hosts do still like you have a feed and there's one link and li Some people can them, listen yeah. to it. Um, and then version two was like, okay, now we can do unique codes and we can tell us how many you want. And it was literally like a script I ran on my computer that generated codes. And then we could go in and block them if they wanted, but it, they had to tell me who they wanted to block. And I had a spreadsheet of this person <laughs> is this code and went in and said off. So yeah, there's like, you know, when you're a little kid, you tell them that in the vending machine, there's an elf running behind <laughs> and the little elf behind Hello Audio. It right. wasn't even called Hello Audio. It was called Podcast Your Course. So let's be real. But I don't like, even know if it was little... called that by then. It must've been, you know, I mean, it was, it was. Yeah, yeah. it was podcastyourcourse.com. Yeah. We still are paying for that domain, by the way. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And we did that heading into, so I think in October is when we first sold the licenses and then. We obviously started Deb. We heard a little bit of that story in the beginning of 2020. The world was a little crazy, but then, um, so um, anything you want to share about taking it from that step, mm -hmm. right, to the spreadsheets and the scripts, and then like actually building a product for the first time, having never been head of product or product anything, right, ever. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think. Nora could wear all three of our hats pretty well. Like I think yes, you were giving always. me like, here's what a user story is. I'm like, I didn't yeah. know what that was. <laughs> it was yeah. like some very corporate document thing that had screenshots and write-ups. Derek's so, Googling like yeah, how to be a product what, manager. What's a product manager do? <laughs> um, that's totally not true, but maybe true. Kind but yeah. Partially. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, luckily I do credit the early development work with Bill being a good non-technical developer like they were able to hold my hand as i worked out what does this thing do in a web app version now what do i need to think about the questions you don't realize you need to think about like yeah just account management is such a headache in the early stages when you don't really yeah. know how it's going to work and how to set up stripe properly initially yeah i was just gonna say taking stuff. money hardest thing it's crazy and i feel like it is yeah in like general business too, how to get money from somebody yeah. is for whatever reason, super complicated. Right. So never mind what Hello Audio does functionally on our feature list in the pricing table, but like just the boilerplate bare minimum of a SaaS product, there's a lot that has to get set up before you even start talking about what the actual thing does for the users. And so that kind of stuff we hadn't really, I don't know, bumped our head against long enough to understand what we were working with and it we've learned as we went and it was a good mm -hmm. experience um but yeah I, that was surprising to me and it still is every time you go to anytime you go to set up a domain you're like what do i have to change what are all these settings it's just like, there's some base amount of work that has to be done when setting up anything and just a subscription SaaS product no matter what it does there's base amount that's pretty substantial just to get up and running with anything never mind the features so yeah um, how did you think about I can remember this, but from your perspective, you know, working with Bill, I think it took Bill about six weeks. We had built it a couple times up into that point. So we learned some stuff along the way, but Bill hit the ground running, um, built it in six weeks. And we had our first users in there around that time. It was probably six to eight. I don't remember exactly, but um, what did you think about the MVP and like revealing that to people like because <laughs> lifetimers hadn't even seen it up until this point even like let's get into the we let the beta people in first I think but like I remember being on Voxer with my friends who were lifetime licenses I'm like go look and then I was like kind of embarrassed but like I want to hear from oh, your perspective I, that's funny yeah. I didn't think that I knew it wasn't I perfect it. but it, and yeah. I find myself more in that mindset what you just described now than I was then. Oh, that's interesting. And so when we release a product feature now, I'm nervous because I'm like, I know what's missing in this a lot more because back or then like, I just didn't will it know. Break it? I'm just happy that you can log in. That's a win yeah. for me. <laughs> so now I'm like, okay, this should probably work better. We've been around for three years. Like we shouldn't push features that have issues like this. Mm -hmm. And I know we're making trade-offs of what would be the best version of the thing we're releasing and what we can get accomplished in a decent amount of time. So yeah, there's always trade-offs and um, I'm more conscious of them now than I was back then. So back then I, I didn't think that. I was just like, 
you're like it works way more it makes a yeah it makes a podcast you can log in and there's not airs everywhere there's air somewhere but not everywhere um but yeah i was happy to be the customer support person answering questions solving people's problems and it was a huge amount of information coming into my brain that got pushed to the development like process into, I don't know if we were using ClickUp then, but whatever tool we were using for tasks, like I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, but just being the support person on those early days was just huge amount of like, oh yeah, we should do that. Or this is important. A lot of people are asking for this. It helped us just prioritize the product like roadmap. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of things we wanted to get accomplished. I remember, I think I went back through Slack at some point in the last few months and looking at like, okay, now we can do this. Now we can do this. I'm like, that was really cool. That was a lot of stuff moving really fast, the basic stuff. It's not anything amazing, but it's like, wow, that's cool. We can, I couldn't remember an example. They can download receipts or something like that. Um, yeah, transcription was done or something like that. Mm -hmm. Just little features that are that we now take for granted. And it was an amazing win often. Whereas now we have a longer release cycle and it's more, the code is just bigger now. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. I, I was going to ask you a question and I'm like, I don't want to lead, but I was like, this is such a leading question, but um, in, so I guess a couple of things. So when we first released the product, right. And we weren't really, we were really concerned about functionality over making mm. it look Looks, super pretty. Yes. Right. And like then, you know, true. made the UI and kind of experience. We think it was, it was cool to see. I think as, as we looked at big features and, um, I think our experience, our collective experience made it easy to prioritize things we knew were going to be important for coaches and course creators and things like that. So mm -hmm. I think it helped in that way. Talk to me about, because I think this is something that most people who aren't involved in a tech company don't understand the reality of integrations and how oh like this is, but this is a big <laughs> deal. Like this is, and most people, like, oh, no, she's going but, there. A, God, but I think no, it's, it's important it's because most so people true. think it's super simple and it's just a hand, yeah. like why are you, and how like, let, I mean, I love zoom. We use zoom a lot for all of our internal meetings. So not knocking zoom, but like the integration with zoom and, and how difficult these things can be and how long it yeah. takes and how we know our users want them. And it's not always super simple. Not always super simple. There's weird business decisions that you're not in control. Like we have our yep. own business decisions yep. to make, but then to integrate with another business who's making their own yep. business decisions for reasons you don't know or understand. Really? And Zoom, for example, is a documented integration where they are saying, we are Zoom. Come integrate with us. Come Here's us. our documentation. This is the way Here's how to do it. And, and we build our integration based on that. And then they're like, oh, we're changing oh, we need super security because all of a sudden we're a publicly traded company mm -hmm. in a country that has certain rules. And like we as an integration now need to meet some requirements that weren't there originally. So we need to change our integration and authentication. So yeah. Descript is, is a little bit different because we were fortunate enough to partner with them and like mm -hmm. they opened up something that wasn't publicly available for anyone to integrate with. And so that was built specifically for us and them to work together. But other ones still, the best case ones that are well-documented and like a well-trodden path that other people integrate with still has issues and problems yeah. because they and it, change They stuff. hijack our roadmap or like what we're working on because it's like, oh, that's an important feature that a lot of people use. So we have to like, you know what I mean? Arguably, I think the Zoom one is probably one of the most used integrations we probably have just because well, we do video to audio. I'll, I'll say Zapier. Zapier, oh, Zapier is the most well, used yeah. one because it's the integration like, of integrations. Our whole company is an integration. I I know, but they have their own requirements and they change yeah. stuff on us and we have to go fix yeah. it. So yeah. yeah, it's tricky because yeah, you're keeping your code base afloat and users happy and then you're dependent on someone else's. I mean, integrations are clear and like very obviously a line is Hello Audio is here and to the right and then the other companies here and to the left and it's a line. But then you get into stuff like we're using packages that need updates, you know, I don't know what um, our code base runs on node version, whatever, and then it changes and you might have to update it or not, or it goes, stops being uh, maintained and you're stuck and you have to go update your code base. So there's non-integrations that were dependent on other stuff happening outside of our company. Um, but yeah, that's just the nature of software and yeah, it is a lot of work to just keep integrations up to date it's true. for sure. But what is cool is that you start to have companies that start saying, Hey, um, our users are talking about integration with you. 
And that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of cool to know that our user base is, yeah. you know, now asking for certain integrations, which is pretty fun. Yeah. People, yeah, come to us. Exactly. They want an integration and it's like, we would love to, but they don't have an ability to do that. And so they go back to the company and be like, Hey, this company wants to integrate with you. Can you do something about it? Yeah. yeah. For sure. I have a question or something I think would be fun to talk about is um, around like the product vision, because I think a couple of years ago when audio was like blowing up, right? Clubhouse, that's oh, like when yeah. we were coming out. And so we're on the other side of that. The tech world is very different. VC funding, um, I mean, all the things, right? Layoffs, there's a bunch happening specifically in this uh, in the tech space. But all that being said, um, in thinking about like where we could have taken the product mm. early on and some of those early choices we made. And I just brought up Clubhouse and I brought up that hype that was happening. And there was a lot of, um, private podcasting for work. And again, we just stayed with our niche and we're like, these people really love us. Their people love us. Um, this is what we're focused on. But can we talk maybe a little bit about what you thought about not maybe building a podcast player mm. early on? And I don't know, just some of those early big decisions or, or getting into B2B and what that looks like and how we have to always dance with that. And yeah. I, I was wondering what you were So the podcast app decision was an early choice we made with even before, maybe even before Hello Audio existed, but it was, do we build a player was an mm. early question. And the answer was no, because I think because of our experience in the course development area before that and seeing people who basically we got experience using a lot of course platforms and we uh -huh. noticed a pattern of any time any of them wanted to use another tool that was like a third or fourth party tool from the course platform, that the students were already logging into, it was just a huge drop off in actual, yeah. like going to that other place, the other app. I think specifically with like communities, people were like yes. hating Facebook, Facebook groups yep. and they're like, yep. we need another tool. And they came out one every month and just, they never they're caught on. And so yep. they're still coming out. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So with that, seeing that trend and that failure in my head, that was the exact model of we shouldn't build another app because the people are just not going to go there to listen to content. People don't download a Vimeo app to watch your course videos. Why would they go download a Hello Audio app? We want what's already being used. And that was the beauty yes. of it. We wanted the app that we wanted the audio content to live side by side with the habits that they already have for listening to whatever podcast, the daily, whatever. Um, so we wanted that course to live in his place that the person already had a, a habit of going to opening the app, listening to stuff, consuming content. That's why we didn't go with the app route initially. Still an option, but um, that for sure was a no early on to yeah, build that. I, think I don't think it would be very difficult tech lift wise. I know it would be, but it's not because it's so hard. It, that was mm -hmm. never a reason. It, we could have done I mean, it. There's so many players. <laughs> there are, yeah. yeah. And they all act differently, which is all. And hard. I, yeah, we have a long list of features that our app would do differently for our user base for sure mm -hmm. someday. But yeah, it's still the friction of having to point users to another app to go access stuff when they're already in a place like a course. We're trying to not get them on the website so much and like staring at stuff on their computer. So the app already existing on their phone was a huge benefit. Just like it's there, it can be played. They don't have to go install or log in or create an account with something else as a listener, which especially I think with gets iPhone, the podcast app is literally on their phone. Even if they never have listened to a podcast ever, they still have that app that comes with the phone, and that's pretty huge. And so it's not making a new account. They already have an account, not making a new iCloud, whatever, Apple login or Spotify login. They already are set up for that. So if we were like Hello Audio app, and then the listener has to go make an account, that's just more friction. So the whole point was to make it super quick and easy to start listening on the go, which the apps already existed. And then the other question about B2B, I think mm -hmm. was a totally different reasoning. I mean, I think Nora can speak to it more than I can. And product wise, it's more a business strategy and like what our team would have to look like if we went that route. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, it's same with there ed, would be tech. product changes but of it course. was heavier more on the like yeah the <clears throat> execution of it and support of it yeah yeah sales team longer sales, sales cycles mm -hmm. just our business is we're not set up for that we would have an org of restructuring to try and achieve that totally. goal if that's what we're shooting for the cool part i think about that is that there are choices 
And Mm -hmm. not every company, especially not every tech company, can look at their product and say, this could be used as an ed tech product. And this changes the game in education. This can change the game in company communications and corporate. This can change the game in the creator market. Like not many tech companies can look across markets in that way and think that our product could be used across all three. And people are using it in all of these different ways. So that is kind of the cool part, like sitting back. And even though we purposely made the choice to stay where we are and where we focus on, it can absolutely send all of those markets, which is cool. Yeah. People, yeah, write in asking, can I use this for my internal company stuff? Yeah, totally. You totally can. You know, if you're, I don't know, I'm trying to think of like a government agency, maybe you have certain security requirements that we wouldn't meet, but like it technically is possible to deliver audio recordings to people that work at your company. Um, and people do that in lots of different companies internally. And yeah, the, the B2B thing, it's like, yeah, if you just want to focus the entire company in that direction, it's just a shift of just the way we operate. So it's true. Okay. Yeah. I'm curious. What is mm-hmm. your favorite feature? That, <laughs> and I want all three of us to answer this because <clears throat> we might have the same feature, but what is one thing about the software where you're like, you just, you're happy knows that it does what it does. Favorite thing Hello Audio does is it's the moment you take 30 videos on your desktop and drag it in and they populate in the list and they upload and they convert and you can hit check all publish. That's awesome. Yes. I think that's the best thing. I think it's what we built the product for initially podcast your course was like, you have a ton of videos ready to go and you just want them in audio form. Um, just drag and drop them and they get converted and they can be published in bulk now. That didn't exist from the beginning, but now you can. Um, does that count as a feature? I don't I know. I think it but... totally, it's satisfying to watch the little, yeah. like the little yeah. bars load. Mm-hmm. You're like, check done. It is, yeah, it is very satisfying to watch and do that. Yeah. Just the whole, the bulk, just ability to just bulk create episodes, I think is my favorite thing, which mm-hmm. I don't think anything else does. So that makes me happy. Love that. All right, Lindsay, yeah. what's yours? It has to be the thing that I was waiting for forever oh, yes. to come. And it's come up. It's Zoom. It has to oh. be because we've done so many coaching calls and hangouts with our community and just whatever. And it was my job to put it on. Of course, we're going to have a private podcast feed of it. And it was my job to put it on. And now, as long as my Zoom you know, has enough space on the cloud, um, I can just go into the audio inbox and copy it to or send it to the right feed and it's done. It's my favorite. I waited a long time. Um, And I think that favorite is also tied to what I think was my favorite use case very early on in Hello Audio, which was coaching calls, Mm. question and answer calls, because those were always the things that if I didn't show up, I was not rewatching. And so I feel like we we, um, have opened up what can be a goldmine for people that have the time to listen, um, but not the time to maybe show up. And I think we open that up for people in a huge way. I don't, there's no way we can get a number or a percentage, but for anyone who's hosted a course and has had it live and you put your recordings there that say Q and A recording or coaching call from, if you looked at the data from how many times that was clicked, it is probably horrifically low. And so I would hope to think that at Hello Audio, having that feed version just increases it. Even just a bump of like 25% would be huge. So I think it's tied to that. Love that. I'm going ninja with mine. So of it course. is always the I ninja features, less. right? But, but th- so there's two and it's all, it's the personalization. When we yeah, had yeah. the ability to add someone's first name in the title of an episode, I was like, this is the coolest cool. thing ever. Yes, we've done it all the time in our email marketing tools, right? And it was like the coolest thing to be able to communicate with the user that way. And then to take that a step further and be able to drop specific content. The listener tags were everything, I think, to me. Because I was like, now we can, this is segmentation at its finest. Who does audio in private podcast segment? No one. Like this is... For me, that was the big, yeah. Is it a ninja feature? Yeah. You don't have to do, but it really, to me, it just changes the game when you know exactly who's listening on to, on the other end. And now you can slip a whole episode, uh, you know, whether it's a pre-roll or a post-roll based on that specific person and their behavior. Like, oh, that to me was that we have the coolest product ever. <laughs> like that, was, that made a big difference. 
You know what I love about our answers is they're absolutely our personalities. Yes. So of course, head of product is going to be like the main Amazing. like thing, the first thing that someone does. And of course, I'm going to be like, I forget to do stuff all the time. <laughs> and I talk a lot on these calls. And so I guess somebody should, I don't know. And so of course, it's Zoom. And then Nora's is ninja marketing. Ninja. I don't know. That was good. Without even planning it, that mm. was very Pretty reflective. Cool. I can spin um, Nora's answer into my answer also, <clears throat> meaning the tagging, the segmenting actually opens up a solution for a lot of users, mm. I'll say issues, but like they want to do something that we didn't intend for Hello Audio to do. A lot of people want to sell one episode at a time. Oh, yeah. And so the, um, they always ask, how do I do that? And actually mm. tagging lets you do that. And it wasn't what we intended for it to be, but it totally worked for you can say somebody bought this give them this episode, only that episode. So people that have this tag can listen to that episode. So they have to set up, you know, it's kind of a setup. It's not built for that, but it totally works. So yeah, that tagging option on episodes does solve in kind of a roundabout way, solves problems for people that we didn't intend for. It's pretty cool. Which I think is cool when you're just like, oh yeah, that that is possible. It's a little convoluted, but it works and you can do it this way. But yeah, I've had to answer that question a few times in the inbox. So what were some of the hardest challenges, like technically yeah. maybe, like that you had to problem solve for um, hmm. and how you thought about solving that problem? I'm trying to think back to drip feeds and tagging with drip feeds is weird. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that we have three different types of feeds and then we have features that affect the release of stuff is odd. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it doesn't feel this way probably to users, but releasing episodes and drip feeds and tags and um, well, the advanced Instant. date based feeds, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the fact that there's a welcome oh, episode yes, required. Yeah. There's just odd little things that happen when you start mixing around your playing. If you just think of the episodes in a list of things, straightforward, super simple to organize, and it's the drag and drop to put them in the right order. Easy peasy. Even date based, super simple, put them in reverse chronological order. That's the episodes that appear for everyone in the right place. And then you start fiddling with when episodes appear in date based feeds, um, date based feeds with tagging. And then the, the, um, advanced state based feeds where they don't get the back catalog what episode shows up first just having to shuffle oh, things seasons. yeah oh, i didn't even think about seasons seasons Did i've, I've thought it? some seasons <laughs> <laughs> that was bang for the brain power is probably the lowest roi <laughs> like how hard it was to get that out and how much it solved people's problems was not very much. Mm -hmm. it was, it's still a nightmare of maintaining seasons. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. I didn't yeah, realize it was going to be that we, hard. Yeah. Yeah. What we talked about earlier is like, <laughs> for people, it's like we build, we like host and then have to send the file to every podcast player, right? And so we have to play by their rules and guys, like spoiler alert, they all have different rules. And so like, it, it, we have this whole document, right? Derek had to build a table of how seasons behave in every app. That's so it's not just our app that we're dealing with. We're at the whim of how podcast players decide to do stuff. And like, they don't make the same decisions, which I'm not surprised about from a perspective of we're a tech company making decisions. Like everyone's isolated, but it is something very particular about our access feeds, I guess, and that they've been around for 20 years. And here we come along just like, effing around with all of them and just being like, why can't it do this? And we're like making it behave totally differently. Um, and um, we have to test that and then see what it looks like on mobile, on desktop, on, on every player. And it just adds layers to the solve the tech problem. But um, yeah. it's kind of funny watching your brain have to think through when we try to release something like that, what needs to be thought through around it. Yeah. I try and I still miss stuff and yeah. yeah, it comes up later. You're like, oh crap, I did not think about what happens if somebody has seasons on a drip feed with tags and <laughs> yeah, and they're trying to <laughs> do something odd I didn't think about because they're using a tool like yeah. a third party and integration. And they're listening on iHeartRadio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In their, yeah, in their Cadillac, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is different than the Chevy for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So funny. Um, I can say a niche feature that I'm just confident it's always going to work. And I kind of like the way we built it. And it's not anything shiny or fancy. It's just 
the Thrivecart integration. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at what we did and how we did it, it was very like Thrivecart didn't have like, here's how to integrate with us. If you go into Thrivecart, it's a behavior and then they have a place for an HTML form. And I, they didn't have much documentation on that, but it was a place to paste code. And I'm like, what is this form? And I wrote to their support. What do I do with this? Do you have an example? And they were like, yeah, you can do this. And they sent it back. It was a MailChimp form. I'm like, cool, let's build an integration that talks to that part of Thrivecart. And it totally works. And it's a passing of the name, email address, tags, whatever you want, status, if you want to block them, add them delete them, whatever you want to do for your listener based on something happening in Thrivecart, it could totally be done with that integration. And it just makes me happy that it's like always working fine. I'm just mm -hmm. confident in that integration. Whereas if I followed, I don't know what an example would be, Mailer Lights integration, just it's documented, but not completely. And it's just odd. So yeah, I don't know. Not confident in that one at all. But Thrivecart, I'm just like, it's going to work great. And I like that it works the way it works and it's pretty straightforward. Nothing shiny, but it's just good. What are you most excited about where Hello Audio is going? Ooh, how big am I allowed to get? Um, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. It's like episode four, so I don't know. <laughs> so I see a future where it's not on RSS feeds and RSS mm -hmm. is, I don't know if it's died, but it's gone the way of basic or some old and rss 2.0 is like raw. no it's no like that's not a new anything. thing yeah no i'm saying we're no longer using rss to deliver episodic content it's a weird way to do it it's just super weird i don't i know why it exists but it mm -hmm. doesn't need to work that way not if we had our own app it wouldn't work that way like we could take mm -hmm. in rss fees but it wouldn't be delivered that way if you built audio delivery to people or any sort of list of content being delivered to people you would not start with rss it's weird mm -hmm. um so future is a different standard i guess um but then everyone's trying to get vertical and just be like spotify and just be like we don't play that game we own everything from the bottom up and so they have their own, it's not even a standard. It's just their own mm. way of delivering stuff to their listeners. So I don't want to go that route. I mean, I, if we built an app, I guess we would go that route, but we would still play nice with other people's standards. But I, I hope there's some better way than RSS. It's not smart. We don't need to do it that way anymore. It's weird. Yeah. I don't, yeah. So before we recorded, Nora, you're like, we can talk about RSS feeds, but not get oh, yeah. too nerdy here. I don't know what you said exactly, but yeah, it, I can't believe it works the way it works. It just, it's dumb. So but we're working with it. <laughs> I can't believe that people's apps around the world are on their phones and every 15 minutes they say, Hey, do you got any new episodes? Every app does that and asks, hello, audio. Do you got any new episodes? And then some of them wait two days before they ask and that's how they get new stuff it's like we make it available immediately but it's like they have to ask us you got anything new and we say yep here you go <laughs> it's so, so dumb weird. <laughs> yeah i hate it so future of hello audio is not using <laughs> was dark. No, <laughs> yeah i know um i mean the future could be better right um uh, i guess it wasn't dark but i hate it isn't it? <laughs> yeah, i hate it i hate rss <laughs> I don't, it's fine. It's just odd. It doesn't have to work that way. We have better ways of running the internet since RSS has come out. Yeah. I would hope since yeah. that was 21 years ago. Well, well, that was podcasting with RSS, but blogging with RSS was even before that. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, is there anything like, what are you like most proud of? Oscar. I mean, I. I <laughs> Fair. That's very our fair. son. Um, yeah. that's fair. <laughs> um, I met with the product and um, I clearly Thrivecart is up there. I don't know if there's anything else you're like, I'm proud we figured that out. Or... Oh, Thrivecart wasn't like, I'm so proud of it. I just, like that yeah, it works. Like, it I'm just confident works. in it. it. I don't have, mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't keep me up at night. Um, most proud of with Hello Audio stuff, product wise, I like that. It it really delivers on the promise of just getting content into podcast apps and it makes it super simple to do that. I think the catchphrase or whatever we want to call it for what Hello Audio does is it gets your content into podcast apps without having to create a podcast. 
And that's really the problem we were solving from day one. If you go to another podcast host that was built for podcasting and you want to put a course in it, it's a big fight to get that thing up and running. And it's just not built for that. And you feel it. And so the fact that- And we... the course platforms who've now released private podcasting, which isn't many, but the ones that have- they are realizing what a fight is, the apps mm -hmm. and the unique, not necessarily the unique link, but the giving of access to people and taking back access. And there's no dripping. There's no other things because it's a lot. It's not that simple. And mm -hmm. they're a course platform. So they have so many other things that they're dealing with and working on. And so it never works in the way yeah. of the customization, personalization and stuff that we've done too. Yeah. Yeah. I think just the core promise being delivered to the users consistently and it does work great. Just, um, we talked about this too with people when we explained the product of like, how hard is it for somebody to do what Hello Audio does without mm. Hello Audio? And there's easy ways to do on an individual level the things that Hello Audio does, but there's not a one-stop shop that actually accomplishes what people want to accomplish in one spot mm. and gets it done. Yeah, no, we talked And there's about... even stuff we want to add to oh, that, yeah. right? Like for sure. Yeah, we're still not where that makes. Yeah, that... back to my favorite part of just being able to bulk upload a whole bunch of stuff and convert it. It's like, you can go to janky sites and drop, an ep drop a video file and it'll convert to audio. You can go to a podcast app and put an episode in there. Um, but yeah, just the one-stop shop of just putting everything in a podcast feed quickly and easily for your listeners still, I think is the best part. I love our stat. So we have over 70% oh, of our yeah, users yeah. create oh, yeah. their first feed mm -hmm. in 24 hours. To me, I'm the most proud of that because I that think was with any tech surprising. App, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were surprised when we saw it. We're like, no, that's so happy, right. right? I mean, I think yeah. seeing that is like, we... We intentionally, because we've all used tools, each and every one of us, mm -hmm. and we've used tools that we hate <laughs> and we never wanted to use again, right? And then we've used tools where I'm like, oh, that was so easy to use. So I think the intention behind creating such a product that was so easy to use and then to see it backed up in that stat, I think was a big moment to see that and say, it is actually easy. And then when we did the testimonials and the success stories feed, time after time, it's so easy to use. It's so easy to use. And it was like, mm -hmm. oh, we don't actually have to tell people it's easy to use. We no, said we everyone to, yeah. else is doing it for us, which is that to me was building a product that not only delivers on the promise, but does it in a way that people actually can do it fast and the time to mm -hmm. value is fast. Like that, that's, that was a big deal. We've gotten a little bit away from the start when we had lifetime users who had purchased but hadn't logged in yet. Yep. But there was a while where once a week we would get an email yeah, yeah. and then maybe like change once later, a month. Yeah. If somebody's alive. like, yeah. hey, I just logged in. I don't know what took so long. It was really easy. <laughs> like I sat on this because I thought it was going to be hard and I needed to spend a lot of time preparing. And I logged in. I'm like, oh, it's that simple. I should have done this a long time ago. So yeah, the lifetime people who don't log in and then they do it finally and they're like, wow, that was really simple to get that up and running. So yeah, we would get an email every once in a while from people saying like, yeah, should have done it sooner. Super easy. Should have yeah. done it sooner. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, we got to wrap up because yeah, we do. Oscar man has just arrived. He's coming back from the nanny. Well, this was really fun. Mm -hmm. Reminiscing, going down the product road. Um, yeah, this won't be the last time we talk. Who knows what it'll be about? Just Maybe down Eric the hall. Will run some, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> I know where to find you. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll have you on for other things. Uh, it was cool to hear your side and and um, just talk about it again. We love doing all oh, Reminiscing. Hello. Yep. Reminiscing. <laughs> coming up on three years, mm -hmm. wow. I think. Yeah, three years in November. Cool. Well, thanks for hanging out and yeah. we'll see you next time. Bye. And there you have it, audio heads. Another episode of Laundry Private Podcast is in the books. I hope you're leaving today feeling even more ready to amplify your voice and connect with your audience in meaningful ways. The adventure continues in our next episode with even more insights, strategies, and inspiration to help you along your own private podcasting journey. Of course, make sure to check out helloaudio.fm to start your own private podcast. And remember, you've got amazing content that needs to be heard. So let's turn the volume up. Until next.